On the 13th of September, 1890, deep in the African interior, the Union Jack, that fabled flag of the British Empire, was raised upon a makeshift flagpole by a Royal Naval Lieutenant by the name of Edward C. Tyndale Biscoe. Arranged before him in neat ranks were the remaining 500 men of Lieutenant Biscoe's British South Africa Company Police Squadron. And in attendance also were some 290 civilian volunteers, pioneers, privateers, adventurers, and fortune seekers. And as the low rumble of a 21-gun salute echoed across the empty felt of Mashonaland, the British colony of Rhodesia was born. And then on the 18th of April, 1980, Amid much hubris and celebration, that same Union Jack was lowered. The nation state of Zimbabwe was born. And 90 years of British imperial history in Africa came to an end. 90 years, ladies and gentlemen. Almost no time at all when one considers everything that was built, all that was achieved, and everything that was fought for in that mere moment in time. When I reflect on the history of Rhodesia, ladies and gentlemen, I find myself thinking of it in terms of it being the problem child of the British Empire perhaps even the brilliant problem child of the British Empire. It was, without doubt, one of the most glorious and high-profile phases, but also the most traumatic, bloody, and dangerous of all the episodes of British imperial history on this great continent. But it also happened to be the theatre of magnificent adventure and exploit in the grand old Victorian sense of the word, such as would inspire Sir Henry Ryder Haggett to write his epic novel, King Solomon's Mines, basing his hero, Alan Quatermain, on the life of Frederick Courtney Salu, one of the more august sons of Rhodesia, but also arguably the poster child of the white man in Africa. Imperial poet Rudyard Kipling composed his ballad If on the life and travails of a certain Leander Starr Jameson, who would emerge in due course as the first substantive administrator of the colony of Rhodesia. And one of the most inspired imperial poets, a man that I'm sure many of you Australians will also know, Kingsley Fairbridge, who happened to be a Rhodesian in his early life and who composed these beautiful lines. Behold, my son, the wheel scarred road. Behold, and be afraid. For we the first were better men than those for whom we made. We wrought in death and hunger. We fought the felt we few. Behold this gift of our hands, this road that we built for you. But it must never be forgotten, ladies and gentlemen, that the history of Rhodesia, indeed the history of Zimbabwe, was one of the great and epic tales of the African liberation struggle. So the story that I'm going to tell you in five parts is in fact a story in two parts. And in respect to the fact that the modern history of Southern Africa has been so informed, almost defined by issues of race and race identity, it fairly stands to reason that the broad subdivisions of my story will tend to have a race character. But be that as it may, my intention here today is merely to introduce you to one of the more interesting and compelling themes of British imperial history in Africa. But also, in doing so, I would hope that I'll be able to shed some life, light on some more general themes of European history on this continent. Because although the Portuguese, the Belgian, the German, the French, and the British models were all distinctly different from one another, they shared enough in the way of commonality that a better understanding of one would be a better understanding of all. But again, in respect to the preponderance of Australians, New Zealanders, British, and Canadians that we have amongst us today. I thought it wise to place my emphasis on the British Empire on this occasion. The British Empire, the greatest formal empire in human history. The British Empire was an entity, it was a institution that was founded on the power and the navy of the Royal Navy. And it was sustained throughout its existence by the ubiquity of the British merchant fleet. So it should come as no surprise to anybody that the British were established at the Cape primarily for maritime concerns. First in 1795 and then secondly in 1805 and on both occasions as a consequence of the dispensations of the period Anglo-French wars. The Dutch had held the Cape from the middle of the 17th century onwards in support of their mercantile dominance of the Far East a dominance that they had wrested from the Portuguese in the early part of the century, and which they would gradually begin to lose to the British towards the end of the century. 
And indeed, it was this rise of Britain as the global maritime power of the 18th and 19th centuries that saw Cape Town emerge as one of the most important foreign outposts in a generally rich repertoire of British overseas territories. And no sooner had this happened than the British imprint in Africa, always very deep, would become deepest in South Africa. It would be upon South Africa that would be lavished the lion's share of the enormous moral and material investment that ultimately the British would make in Africa. And of course, in South Africa today, there are still to be found the largest pool of white English-speaking people. And South Africa would also emerge as the most significant theater of British capital adventure and war in the entire imperial period. And of all the British capitalists who would feast on that gorge of South African gold and diamonds, there was none more influential, more controversial, but also more enigmatic than a man by the name of Cecil John Rhodes. Now, the name Rhodes would ultimately resonate with enormous authority throughout Southern Africa, but particularly in South Africa. But he sailed into Durban Harbor one full day in 1870 among a boatload of anonymous adventurers and fortune seekers, all of whom were drawn in one way or another to the diamond fields of Kimberley, which were just at that point beginning to offer some hint of the potential wealth that was lying buried beneath the soil of South Africa. But there was something uniquely different about young Cecil John Rhodes. Consider he was a mere 17 years old. Hmm. He was tall, he was pale, he was stooped, somewhat sunken chested. He had pale, washed out blue eyes. He spoke with a strangely high-pitched and effeminate voice and his breath was drawn into asthmatic lungs with an audible whisper. And yet in his pocket, ladies and gentlemen, he carried a sum of investment capital amounting to 2,000 pounds, which in 1870 was obviously an extraordinary amount of money. And this had been gifted to him by his Aunt Sophie, who appeared to be alone within the Rhodes' extended family, prepared to gamble on the fact that young Cecil had any future at all. Because Cecil John Rhodes, at a very young age, had been diagnosed with consumption, tuberculosis, erroneously as it would transpire, because in fact what he was suffering from was a hole in the heart, a congenital heart disorder, alongside asthma. And so neither his family nor his physicians had any particular expectation that he would live to see the age of 20. So the decision to ship him out to the colonies had been made very much in the hope and possibly even the expectation that the drier climate of South Africa would do something to repair his health. I heard it once said in the most wonderful analogy that Cecil John Rhodes's arrival on the diamond fields of Kimberley in the summer of 1871 was akin to the seeding of a blade of grass under a dripping tap. And I love that analogy. To me, it carries all the imagery of explosive growth. And explosive growth in that instance was precisely what took place. And why it should be that the particular talents and abilities of this most inauspicious child should have been in such perfect alignment to that time and place in history, it's hard to imagine. But they were. In South Africa, the weakling became a man. But on the diamond fields of Kimberley, that man became a titan. Explosive growth was precisely what took place. Cecil John Rhodes prospected on the diamond diggings for some time and uh, profited somewhat, but it was not until he formed a business partnership with a certain Charles Bennell Ray, who was a man nine years his senior, that both men began seriously to prosper. They formed a business based on exploiting the ancillary opportunities of the diamond diggings. Ice manufacture was one example. Another example was the purchase and lease of commercial pumping equipment. And within a few years, both men had acquired a significant amount of capital, individually and collectively. And it was at this point that Cecil John Rhodes' life took a uniquely interesting turn, but also a signature turn. Because Rhodes had for some time nurtured the ambition of winning a degree from Oxford University. Now the reason why has never been specifically articulated in any of the biography of Rhodes that I've read, and there have been a large number, and I've read most of them. But I think what is obvious is that what Rhodes was attempting to achieve was to find some sort of avenue of entry into the British ruling classes. Perhaps imagining that what he lacked in terms of a birthright, he would be able to make up for with wealth and education. And so it was that in the summer 
1873. Cecil John Rhodes set sail from Cape Town for London. And there, using his by now respectable powers of perseverance and persuasion, was able to gain a seat on the Oriel College, a, a fairly modest Oxford College. And incidentally, this began that signature love affair that Cecil John Rhodes would enjoy with Oxford University for the remainder of his life. A love affair that was consummated with multiple endowments. Most notably, I'm sure you know, the Rhodes Scholarship Trust. But most importantly, Rhodes, that summer in Oxford, Rhodes fell very much under the influence of a Victorian social philosopher and thinker by the name of John Ruskin. And at that very summer, Ruskin was beginning a series of highly influential Oxford lectures. And it's from his most influential lecture that I've, extract, that I've extracted this excerpt, which I would like you to read. Now, obviously, at this point, young Cecil John Rhodes would be, would be beginning to identify himself amongst the worthiest and most energetic sons of England. So, as a consequence, he fell immediately in line with this ideal of manifest destiny, this notion that no race upon the planet Earth could aspire to anything greater than to fall subject to the Pax Britannia. In fact, Rhodes was often heard to comment. Has everybody read this? Yes. Question or comment? Yes, she's cancer. Two things, I understand the time period, but he only said he, not she, so men, or is it down here somewhere? Worthiest men, not women. But also, every piece of fruitful waste ground. Isn't that an oxymoron? Fruitful waste. Yeah, I, I imagine it probably is, but I think it was just the uh, Victorian language. All right, let me get rid of that. He was often heard to comment to the effect that, I believe that we are the greatest people on earth. And the more of the earth that we occupy, the better it will be for mankind. And so as a consequence, Rhodes then sailed back to South Africa at the end of 1873. His degree now only partially complete. But he was now heir to a powerful and energized political vision. And that political vision can perhaps best be defined by Rhodes's concept of a rail link from Cape to Cairo in order to amalgamate British South Africa with British North Africa through the acquisition, indeed through the seizure of all of the territory in between, all of which would fall under the Union Jack. Now bear in mind that Rhodes at this point was 20 years old. He was already phenomenally wealthy and beginning to garner significant support and influence within the Cape financial and political circles. And then, in 1877, at the age of 24, Rhodes suffered the first of what would be a number of heart attacks. And apart from being a sobering experience, this immediately introduced him to his own precarious mortality. And moreover, caused him to reflect that if he did not act, both quickly and expeditiously, the chances were that he would not live to see the realization of even a small part of this monumental vision. And here, ladies and gentlemen, lies the seeds of a lot of what, what would happen in the future. Now, I've heard it from quite a few of you so far in informal discussions on the subject that Rhodes was a charlatan, that Rhodes was a crook, a man of questionable moral direction. This I do not agree with. Rhodes was a visionary. But he also felt that he was running out of time. Consider this. This was an excerpt from Rhodes's first will and testament. Now, he wrote a number of wills and testament, but this was the first. So just have a quick read through that. What's implicit here? What is implicit here is that hmm, that even though the natives of the continent, the black man of Africa, might squirm and might resist, once that 
bright light of Anglo-Saxon civilization was to shine upon him. He would unfurl, and he would bask, and he would multiply. To Rhodes, this was a simple article of faith. And if there was to be some small amount of moral blindness in pursuit of the superb goal, All right, let's leave it like that. <laughs> if there was to be a small amount of moral blindness in pursuit of the superb goal, then so be it. But Rhodes would achieve none of this without political office. And this he began to accumulate through campaigning successfully for a seat on the Cape Assembly, representing his home constituency of Barclay West, just outside Kimberley. He took that seat in the summer of 1890, the very year that Rhodes would establish the De Beers Corporation, a vast monopolistic organization controlling the entire diamond output of the Kimberley diamond fields, which in practical terms at that time in history meant the entire diamond output of the world. 1880, 27 years old, Rhodes is well on his way to becoming an extremely big man. And from his platform in the, in the Cape, he was now feeling confident enough to look forward into the hinterland of Africa. Now, let's see if I can get it right. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what he saw. This was the colonial map of Af Africa in 1880. The blue portions are French, the red portions are British, the pink are Portuguese, the black are German, and the yellow is the Belgian Congo. The white area in the middle at that point was unclaimed. Now it doesn't take an awful lot of strategic imagination to see that there was a great deal of incentive for the Germans to claim that territory in order to run a belt across the center of Africa in order to frustrate British ambitions northwards. Likewise, it doesn't take much to see that the Portuguese had the same idea. But in order for Rhodes to achieve his vision, of a rail link from Cape to Cairo, it was imperative that he got that territory. The seizure of the Belgian Congo by the Belgian by King Leopold set in motion what came to be known as the Scramble for Africa. And the rules for the partition of Africa were established in a conference held in Berlin between 1884 and 1885. Now there were two key tenets that were established at that point. And the first of which is that effective occupation had to be seen, had to be proven before any other European country would acknowledge the annexation or the drawing of any territory into any given sphere of influence. The other key tenet was that the incumbent indigenous authority, meaning the chiefs and headmans and kings and such like, would be required to request the protection of that state. In other words, before annexation would be recognized, a treaty had to be held bearing the mark of that king. Now, broadly speaking, within that area, this was relatively easy, where incumbent indigenous leadership on the whole tended to be fractured and disunited, which offered enormous opportunity for predatory concession seekers to play one off against the other and to gain control over vast areas of territory. But the territory that we would today recognize as Zimbabwe was manifestly not thus treated. It fell under the substantive control of a centralized monarchy known as the Amandabele, the Matabili, or quite simply the Indabele. And interesting people, the Indabele were a close blood and ideological relative of the much more robust Zulu people who occupy what we also would today recognize as the KwaZulu-Natal province of South Africa. And like the zoo, the social organization of the Indabele was based on highly organized, extremely disciplined, and extraordinarily aggressive military cantons, all of which fell under the central command of an absolute monarch by the name of Lobengula. And Lobengula ruled from his capital city of Kubulawea, translated literally meaning the place of slaughter, which gives a fairly clear indication of the mindset of the Ndebele. And they had no interest in ceding one inch of territorial sovereignty to anybody. And what's more, on a strictly local level, they had more than enough muscle, military muscle, to back that up. But Lohengula was aware of one salient fact, and that was one decade earlier, the much more powerful 
Zulu people, when it became clear that they had become an encumbrance to British imperial advancement, had been relatively easily crushed by the British. And Lobangula was aware that if he did not manage this three-dimensional encroachment of Europeans onto his territory, that same fundamental faith would lie in wait for the Indabella. But that notwithstanding, his court at Bulawayo had been besieged for months, perhaps even years, by an army of foreign concession seekers representing private and public interests from across the European imperial spectrum. But not one so far had been able to gain the mark of the king on a substantial document. And the reason for this is that notwithstanding the enormous power that Lobangula held within his hands, he remained a weak, vacillating and indecisive man. He was fundamentally unable to make a decision. And this, incidentally, was also the conundrum that Rhodes was dealing with from his platform in the Cape and within his efforts to try and bring the territory of Matabili land and subject states into the British sphere of influence. Charles Donnell Wright had been encamped outside Bulawayo for months at the head of a three-man diplomatic mission attempting to gain the mark of the king on a document on behalf of the British South Africa Company, affording the company rights to enter Matabili land for the purpose of limited prospecting and limited mining within Matabili land and subject territories. Now, before we proceed any further, I'd like you to just take a step back and consider the significance of Rhodes's decision to use a royal chartered company in his efforts to annex Matabili land and subject territories. Now, that was not in any way unique. The idea of a royal charter company was a publicly subscribed company that was empowered by a royal charter issued by a monarch which basically gave them the opportunity to choose and exploit, occupy and administer any territory within the world. The most well-known example of a British royal chartered company was of course the East India Company. But within the African context there was the Royal Niger Company which broke the territory that would in due course become Nigeria. And then the Royal East Africa uh, Company that broke the territory that would in due course become Kenya and Uganda. But by far the most powerful and well-funded Royal Chartered Company was the British South Africa Company. But in the meanwhile, Lobangula remained in the grip of an extremely difficult and uncomfortable political conundrum. He was under enormous pressure from his indunas, his military commanders, and from his impis, his military regiments, to order a move on Bulaway in order to remove the white man from the territory both quickly and violently which could have been achieved very easily within an afternoon but Lobangula once again was aware of the fact that if he was to give that order he would have simply invited upon himself the full weight of the British Empire and that definitively would have been the end of the Matabili Road so as a consequence he made the only practical decision that he could make under the circumstances and this was to appeal for the protection of the strongest of his enemies and it takes no particular acumen to determine that the strongest of his enemies were the British. And of course no particular acumen to determine that the strongest amongst the British was Cecil John Rhodes, or Ilozi, as the Matabili themselves called it. So as a consequence, Charles Donnell Rhodes, within a few months, was in a position to ride from Bulawayo to Kimberley and hand to Cecil John Rhodes the key that would unlock Matabili land and Mashonaland for the British South Africa Company. This document in due course came to be known as the Rudd Concession. And as such, it has achieved infamy in both Zimbabwean and Rhodesian politics and history. And the reason is this. The difference between what Lobangula thought he was signing, what he was told he was signing, and what ultimately appeared on paper. Lobangula agreed to a maximum of 10 men entering his territory for the purpose of limited mining and prospecting under the condition that they remain subject to his laws. You must understand that Lobangula was illiterate, as were all of his advisors, so he had no choice but to rely on the white man himself for an accurate interpretation of what had been committed to paper. And he was lied to. What you see before you was in fact what amounted to the terms of the Red Concession. When Lovangula became aware of this, understandably, 
he was utterly mortified. And he immediately dispatched a two-man diplomatic mission to London, comprising two senior Indunas, in order to deal directly with Queen Victoria, monarch to monarch. And this they did, and they were duly impressed, but not nearly so impressed as they were of a tour of Royal Naval Facilities in Portsmouth, and a display of British artillery fire and machine guns on the ranges of Aldershot. They were then in a position to return to Bulawayo and report to Lobangula the complete and utter futility of ever attempting to go to war with the British. As far as Rhodes was concerned, his primary interest was shining that bright light of Anglo-Saxon civilization on Matabeleland. The document was never intended to be binding. It was simply to satisfy the terms of the Act of the Berlin Conference and to satisfy the British colonial office that the necessary protocols were being observed. Thereafter, Lobangula could bleat, Lobangula could cry, it made absolutely no difference. News reached Lobangula a few months later of a heavily armed column of 700 white men with all of their retainers, all of their wagons, and all of their livestock poised in British Bechuana land and ready to step into Matabili land. He realized then that for a handful of British gold sovereigns, a few rusty muskets, and a gunboat on the Zambezi River that was never delivered, he had sold his country. The British South Africa Company pioneer column, in the words of Rhodesian historian Sir Hugh Marshall Hull, a core elite of farmers, artisans, and miners, of doctors, lawyers, engineers, of butchers, bakers, soldiers, sailors, of cadets of good family but no particular occupation. One cricketer, three parsons, and a Jesuit. <laughs> but in fact, Rhodes had been extremely shrewd in designing the future demographics of his colony of Rhodesia. And in this regard, he relied on what he termed the second sons of England. And what's in fact implied by this is the younger sons of the British aristocracy, who, according to contemporary British inheritance law, did not inherit. And so they were required, upon their own wit and acumen, to go out and make their own fortunes, and some did. For that, some chose the army, one or two the church, but the vast majority opted at that point in history to emigrate to the colonies, and it was from these that Rhodes harvested his first crop of pioneers. But there was another reason why Rhodes was shrewd, because in the instance of a crisis, and my God, ladies and gentlemen, this situation was nothing if not replete with the potential for a crisis. Rhodes would then be in a position to leverage the support of a large number of well-placed British peers and cabinet ministers to extract their sons and possibly save the day. Because consider this, Lovangula stood at the head of an army, highly trained, regimented, disciplined, rigid, belligerent, pissed off, numbering upwards of 35,000 men. For a force of 700 armed white men to enter his territory with a view to occupying it was an act of almost superhuman bravado. It may have been a calculated risk, but my God, was it a risk. But be that as it may, the British South Africa Company pioneer column in July of 1890 stepped across the border of British Bechuana land and into Matabili land and began to probe really carefully northwards, maintaining at all times as easterly as possible a trajectory in order to avoid overlapping onto the Matabili heartland. Every night, a protective circle of wagons was laid, strong defenses were put in place, and a 10,000 candle power Royal Naval searchlight powered by a mobile steam generator probed the African darkness. And according to Matabili mythology, it was this extraordinary apparition that inspired such awe and confusion in the hearts of the Matabili shadowing force that the order to attack was never given. But again, be that as it may, September 1890, the British South Africa Company pioneer column broached what was known as the Mashonaland Central Plateau, entering a territory that nominally lay within Matabili control but was technically beyond their military reach. There, in the vicinity of a certain Chief Harare, the settlement of Fort Salisbury was founded. The Union Jack was hoisted and the birth of the colony was proclaimed with a 21-gun salute. And thereafter, 
All 290 pioneers filtered out into the surrounding countryside in order to take up the mining claims that had been offered to them as part of their terms of service. While behind them, behind them, the rapid evolution of the British colony of Rhodesia began. But the elephant in the room, quite obviously, would remain the Indobelli. As I have said, they were in situ. They were belligerent. They were armed. And they were extremely angry. And if anything had been learned about the Matabili in the 10 or 20 years prior to that was the fact that they had one solution to any problem, no matter what that problem was, and that was storm force, warfare, and genocide. So quite naturally, war with the Indobelli was going to be inevitable. There was a, there was a, a natural clash between a centralized monarchy that ruled by the device of sheer and inutterable terror and the emergence of what would ostensibly be a modern democratic structure. It's not my intention at this uh, presentation to go into any detail on the two wars that then followed in very close succession. These were the first Matabili War of 1893 and the second Matabili War of 1896. Other than to say that both of them were extremely one-sided and neither was really resolved in any way advantageous to the Matabili. But it could be said with some confidence then by the turn of the century that the native factor in colonial parlance had been pacified. And the native problem, again in colonial parlance, had been solved. This then offered the opportunity for the white settler community of Rhodesia, now numbering upwards of 35,000 souls, to step forward into a new century with the confidence to deal with the much more abstract political problems, in particular pertaining to governance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this point I'm going to stop my story. We'll pick up in the second chapter in my next presentation. But I would like to say that this story as it evolves really frames the story of the rise and fall of almost every African country that experienced colonial rule. So as we travel northwards, I would really implore you all to track me down on the sidelines and discuss with me any of the peculiarities or anything that interests you. We're running alongside German territory at the moment, or an ex-German territory at the moment. We're soon to enter an ex-Portuguese territory at the moment, after which we will then drift into an area of mixed Francophone and Anglophone countries, ending in Senegal, which was the capital, in essence, of the French Empire in Africa, and one of the most extraordinary countries. And I would really implore you again to give me the opportunity to chat to you in private or on the sidelines on any of these subjects. But for the time being, are there any questions pertaining to what we've discussed so far?